In this video, I'm going to go through solutions to part 026 exercises, read from file.m. Uh, I've already filled in a little bit of a solution to this first part just to save myself some time. As with all these exercises, I strongly encourage you to attempt them yourself before watching the solution video such as this one. Much of the code in this will work in Octave as it works in MATLAB, but you're going to need to check out that video I did on how to read data in from file in order to get the file reading part to work in Octave. It's going to be a little bit different. All right, so we've got this file travel data partial.csv, and we want to read it into MATLAB as a matrix. And then we want to calculate the average root length from the eighth column labeled length in miles. And after that, we want to determine the COG ID or COG ID. I'm not exactly sure what this stands for, of the route with the highest average travel time, which is the last column. Now let's take a look at the data briefly before I go into the code here, which is always a good thing to do. I don't actually have Microsoft Office on my computer, so it's just a CSV file though, so I'm just looking at it through Google. Um, link to the exercise and also this uh, file to read in are available in the video description. All right, so we have some, I believe, real world data about various roads in New Mexico. Column A is this COG ID thing, and there's duplicates, right? So you see uh, 10,004 and 10,004 appear twice because the road is gonna have the same ID, but one travel direction is going to be northbound and one is going to be southbound. All right, then we've got like a route ID. What route is it? Uh, I don't know what the card actually refers to. What are some locations? What's the length in miles, etc., etc., etc. But what we're really interested in is on the far right side, oh, which is actually off the screen. So let me try this again. I'm going to open this thing up in Notepad. It's a little bit hard to read, but bear with me here. All right, so here's one row. And on the far right side, we have the average travel time, and it's nine minutes for this road. Now, a lot of roads, whether you're traveling the northbound or the southbound, they might have the same travel time, nine minutes. But others are going to differ. And we're looking for the route that has the highest average travel time, the largest in that last column right there. So how would we do that in MATLAB or Octave? All right, continuing on down here. So here's the solution. I went ahead and wrote it out just to save myself a little bit of trouble. So I'm going to use data equals read matrix, parentheses, the file that I want to read in, right there, in single quotes. Now in Octave, what you'd want to do is you'd want to use uh, package load IO, or is it load package IO? Again, revisit that Octave video. And then XLS read on the same file name. And then it'll read it in the exact same way. In fact, it's literally XLS read right here after you do the package loading. All right, and then I'm going to copy out the eighth column, so all rows, column eight, from the data into a new variable named root length. I just find that that's a convenient thing to do when I don't have too much data and I can copy it into a new variable. I'm going to use the mean function to get the average root length right there. And then I'm going to display it out. Let's actually go ahead and run this code. All right, there's my average root length. And then here's my solution to the next part. Let's go down to that code. I'm going to copy out the very last column. I don't even have to count how many columns there are. I just know it's the last column. Great, I put end in there after the comma. I'm going to use the max function on my average travel times to get not only the maximum travel time, but the position at which it occurs, which is actually more important for what I'm trying to answer in the question here. And then I'm going to say, okay, from the data, at row index, that row where that maximum travel time occurred, column one, put that into a variable named cog ID because the cog IDs are in column one. And I find out that the largest travel time is 10,013. And there we go. And I encourage you to do other experiments with the data to practice your MATLAB skills. But I'm going to move on for now. All right, next question. Write code to create two plots, both with x values from 0 through 20 with an increment of 0 0.1. The first graph will calculate y values using 3 times cosine of x over 2. And the second will graph absolute value of x divided by 2. Use the figure command to separate the plots. OK, so this is practice with graphing. Let's create our x vector, our x-axis vector, 0 to 20. But we want an increment. The default increment here would be 1. We want an increment of 0 0.1. So I put that between the colons there. The y values for my first graph I'll put into a vector named y1. And it needs to be not just 3 cos, but 3 times cos. We're not in math class. We need to explicitly indicate the multiplication in MATLAB or an octave. 
and then x divided by 2. All right, and I might as well just calculate the second figure's calculation. Now, it's a little bit silly that I did absolute value here because we're only going to see the positive half of the graph because of the x values that we chose, but we'll just follow the instructions anyway and go along with it. All right, and then let's go ahead and plot x versus y1 on our first graph. And then we're going to have a separate figure. So I use the figure command, just the word figure all by itself. And then I'm going to plot the second curve on this other graph over here. Let's go ahead and run it. Two figures should pop up. There's the absolute value. And there is the three cosine of uh, x over 2. Now, it's always a good habit to also put like titles and axis labels on these. So I will just very quickly do that. So I was not very inventive with my titles or axis labels, but there they are. You can see that they did show up. The order does matter a little bit. All right, we need to put figure after we're completely finished with the first plot. We need to put the title and X label and Y label commands after plotting in both the first case and in the second case. All of this will work in Octave the same way it works in MATLAB. And that'll be true for all the rest of the code in this document. Continuing on down. I need five equally spaced values starting at three, ending at 1,001. What do I need? Which of these four options? Well, since I need five total values, I need one of the lin spaces. So I either need C or D. Now, the order in which lin space takes its inputs is the starting value, the ending value, and then how many total you need. So D is the correct answer. And you can run that code for yourself if you'd like to verify. Another multiple choice question here. Given the following matrix, this one right here, how do I copy the 99 into a variable? So there's a 99 right there. How do I copy it into some other variable, in this case named x? Which of these does it? Now, it might be helpful to display out the matrix and see what it looks like, which, of course, you are encouraged to do. All right, so there's our matrix right there. The 99 right here, it's in row 3, column 1. So this is the correct answer right here. This would be the way to do it. Row 3, column 1. Continuing on down, write code to generate and display a 6x3 matrix of all 12s. Don't manually type out the 12s. So what I mean by this is I want you to create some new matrix using either the zeros function, 6 rows, 3 columns, plus 12, or the ones function, 6 rows, 3 columns, times 12. And there we go. 6 by 3 of all 12s, 6 by 3 of all 12s. I don't want you to type it out. I want you to know how to generate these uh, using some MATLAB functions. Continuing on down, write code to generate and display a 4 by 3 matrix where the top half is all zeros and the bottom half is all ones. Again, don't manually type stuff out. Okay, so we got a 4 by 3, but only the top half is all zeros. So that means, I'm going to just name it Z, Z equals zeros that are a 2 by 3. And then ones, uh, let's see here. You know what? Let's call it Z's and O's. So then our ones is going to be a ones also of two by three. But then to finally put it together, our let's call it just result here, it's going to be the Z's stacked above the O's, the zeros above the ones. There's my zeros, there's my ones, and there they are composed. We used composition right here to put them together. This semicolon is not actually necessary. Uh, there it is right there. Continuing on down, sum up the values along the upper right to lower left diagonal of a 10 by 10 magic matrix. Display the results. All right, so upper right to lower left is not the default that the diag function calculates, right? The diag function gives you upper left to lower right. But first I should back up and say, okay, we want a magic matrix that's 10 by 10. That's easy enough to get. That function right there will generate 10 by 10 magic matrix and put it into a variable named m. And then we want to add up these values from the upper right to the lower left. So this is the sort of thing where you probably want to Google it if you've forgotten how to do such a thing. But the way I recommend doing it is maybe let's even create a new variable. We'll call it uh, d for the diagonal. And it will be the diagonal of not m, but of the flip left right of m. So there's this function that basically does a mirror image of the matrix you give it. And there's a mirror image flipped left right. And there's also a mirror image flipped up down, but left right is the one that we want here. Now, once I've got that diagonal, I can sum it up. So let's see if this works. I think my 10 by 10 matrix probably won't fit well on the screen, 
but that's okay. Yeah, the 10 by 10 doesn't really fit. Uh, you can only fit five columns there. And then there's the diagonal. And the sum is 505. Let's do a little verification here. So 40, 64, 63. And I'm looking at this upper right corner down to the left. So 40, 64, 63. That is indeed what we're seeing on that diagonal. It appears to have worked. I could do a more thorough test, but I'm pretty confident on that. Continuing on down. This is just an example, no code for you to write here. You can use indexing to rearrange rows and columns. So let's check this out. I'm gonna go ahead and unsuppress matrix M so we see that as well. All right, so here's matrix M. T equals from matrix M, all rows, all columns, but the columns are out of order. First column one, okay, well that's the same. And then column three, and then column two. So columns two and three are reversed, as are columns four and five. All right, now you try it. Use indexing to put the rows of the following matrix in order. Now you could just use sort rows to do this, but that's not what I want. I want you to use indexing to do it. So let's see how we would do it. We have data right here, and let's set it equal to data itself. And the first thing that we want is row three, followed by row four, followed by row two, followed by row five, followed by row one, and then we want all of the columns. And then let's uh, let's just let's just leave it unsuppressed just like that and see what we get. All right, so there's our original, and there's our data in sorted order. So just some practice with indexing. Create a vector of all the odd positive integers smaller than 100 in increasing order and save it into a variable named odds. So this is practice with intervals. So odd positive integers, so we wanna start with one, we wanna increase by two, and we wanna go up to 100 right there. And let's display it out transposed because that'll make it easier to read. There are our odd positive integers. Create a vector of all the even positive integers smaller than or equal to 100 in decreasing order and save it into a variable named evens. Now it's decreasing order this time. So it starts at 100, colon, goes down by two, and let's go down to, let's say zero. No, positive integers, let's go down to two. Zero is not considered a positive integer because zero is neither positive nor negative. All right, and there are our values. Given matrix A below, assign the second column of A to a variable V. After that, change each element of the last row of A to zero. So this is just some arbitrary matrix manipulation as practice. And this is what your output should look like at the end. So here's our matrix. V is going to be the second column of A. So from A, all rows, comma, second column. And then we want to set the last row of A to all zeros. Now MATLAB actually lets you be a lot lazy with this. We can just say A, last row, all columns, equals zero. Here's what we get. There's the second column, and there's the new A with zeros in the last row. If you thought that you needed to do something like zeros and then you know one row, but how many columns? Well, it's gonna be the same as the number of columns in A, so you could use like width and do it that way. That will also work. And I rerun it and it changed because my screen width was different, but here, that will also work. Um, but MATLAB does sort of let you be lazy and you can just put a zero there and it will know to fill in all the values on the left, replace them all with zeros. And that is the end of this exercise.